Hey everyone, it's Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics. Wanted to give a shout out to our latest patron, Merritt Kirkpatrick. Merritt, thank you so much for being a patron of Two Broads Talking Politics. If you would like to be a patron and get some swag and even a hand-knit hat, please check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Two Broads Talking Politics. Hi, everyone. This is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics. I'm on with my co-host, Sophie. Hey, Sophie. Hey, Kelly. And joining us today in our continuing series on climate change is Neil Leary. Neil is the director of the Center for Sustainability Education at Dickinson College in Pennsylvania. Hi, Neil. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Sophie. Thanks very much for inviting me to be part of your uh, your podcast yeah, we're we're excited to talk to you. So uh, for listeners who are wondering how we get our guests, uh, one of the things I did in preparing for this series of episodes was to just Google what are the greenest colleges uh, in the U.S. And on every list you look at, Dickinson is right near the top, uh, which is why I had reached out to you, Neil. So uh, maybe you could start by telling us just a, a little bit about your background and, and how you came to be the, the director for the Center for Sustainability Education at Dickinson. My formal training is as a natural resource environmental economist. Uh, I got a PhD many, many years ago at the University of Washington. Was in academia for a little while, teaching at a, at a small college, and then uh, shifted over to doing work initially with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. While I was there, I got involved in doing research on climate change, which was just fascinating. Um, as a social scientist, economist, be working with lots of different kinds of climate scientists, ecologists, different environmental scientists to try and understand how climate change might affect uh, initially the United States. I then got involved in work internationally, participated in and led some studies of how climate change might impact people in Southern Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Latin America, was really enjoying that work. My oldest child was approaching uh, college age and was researching colleges, kind of, sort of, but not very excited about it. I was the one who was getting excited about it, and i um, not sure why, but I saw an ad from Dickinson College that they were recruiting for a brand new center for sustainability education that they were creating, and I had a friend who had been teaching at this college for, I think, about 18 years at that point, and called him up to find out more and decided I wanted to give this a try. Um, and so that was uh, a little over 10 years ago, that, uh, so that's kind of the route that I took to get here. So where exactly in Pennsylvania is Dickinson, and what what kind of college is it? Yeah, so we're in south-central Pennsylvania. We're about a half an hour drive to the west of Harrisburg. Harrisburg is the capital of Pennsylvania. Dickinson is a uh, residential liberal arts college, so we have only undergraduate students. Almost all of them live on our campus. Uh, we're in the town of Carlisle, which has a population of about 18,000 people. It makes for a perfect setting for you know, getting involved in different kinds of community issues, civic issues, at a scale where it's easy easy for us to understand what's going on and talk with and engage with, you know, sort of the key stakeholders and, and uh, protagonists, advocates on things. So that makes it kind of a nice setting compared to being in, in a big city. So uh, one of the things that sort of struck me is, you know, a lot of the schools that make these lists of, you know, greenest schools, things like that, a lot of them are sort of bigger state schools, things that you've heard of. Uh, and Dickinson, of course, is a, a very small liberal arts school. But one of the things I, I've been thinking a lot about is, you know, it, it it's one thing for government to sort of say we need to, to set certain standards, industry needs to set certain standards to, to get to where we need to be with climate change. But it's a different thing for an institution to say, this is what we want to do as an institution. And it, it looks like Dickinson has sort of taken this on as, as an entire institutional ethos. So it's not just certain decisions are made in certain places about how to be more sustainable, but in fact, is sort of woven into everything that you're doing. 
Yeah, that very much is is the case here. Um, and so this wasn't something that came from on high. It wasn't something that the president or the provost said, this is what we're going to do, that for this to have been as successful as it's been, it required champions, supporters, advocates among the faculty, among students, among administrators. The president and the provost were very supportive of it and played a large role in it, but it really came together because we had uh, support really across the board. The center that I was hired to direct, the Center for Sustainability Education, uh, when that was created with the help of a grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, um, the college matched that grant. And we use that. The grant was focused on the curriculum, on academic programs, but the sustainability initiative extends much beyond that. So we're taking an approach where we're making sustainability very much a part of the co-curricular programs that students participate in so they can get hands-on direct experience on what does it mean to make a campus more sustainable or a community or our college farm. It's also, um, you know, supporting students, student organizations in helping them to choose to create a more sustainable culture on campus. It's part of the way we run our campus in terms of energy use and water use. You know, it's part of how we engage with the community of Carlisle and other, other communities. So it really is an across-the-board kind of an approach, which is, has made it really an exciting place to be, um, very exciting things happening here. So uh, maybe it's a, a good time to sort of take a step back and talk about what the word sustainability actually means. So, you know, so we, we talk, uh, when we talk about climate change and things, there's all these different terms that get thrown around, climate change, climate energy, you know, but what, what does sustainability actually mean? Yeah, so sustainability has a range of meanings that different people bring different ideas, different experiences and contexts to what that term means. Um, so it can get confusing, and that's part of you know, our challenge as we're educating uh, students about what this thing is. So when you look across all the different kinds of uh, ways people define sustainability, there's some things that come across as being common to uh, most, if not all of them. One key part of it is that it is not environmentalism. It's not just about the environment. At the core of sustainability is the idea is helping people to improve their lives, to live a higher quality of life. And doing that in a way where you're paying very strong attention to issues of equity and social justice and paying very close attention to um, understanding that choices that we make today very much determine what is possible in the future, that there's this very strong temporal dynamic of how we use resources today, what investments we make today, the things that we do today are going to shape the future in, in very important ways. Um, so being able to sort of be thinking about that sort of futuristic kind of vision of, of what might happen in the future knowing that it's going to, it's uncertain, but trying to uh, nonetheless have, have some effect on that. So um, that kind of future looking forward is very much part of it. Also very much part of it is the idea that there are limits to the uh, amount that human society can grow and use resources and to understand how we can navigate those limits um, in ways that you know, allow us to live the kind of the, the very uh, flourishing lives that we want, but at the same time, protecting and preserving the natural resources, the, the living systems that we rely upon. So, you know, though that's, that's not like just a, a nice little short definition, but those are some of the ideas and issues that, that are part of a sustainability approach to the world. Follow up question. You mentioned equity and social justice. I'm wondering if you can go into a little bit of detail about how that factors into sustainability? Because for me, I can imagine, you know, what sustainability means in terms of the environment or in terms of what might happen in the future. But it's hard sometimes to come up with ways, actual like concrete changes you can make that have to do with equity and social justice. So I'm just wondering if you could like go into that a little bit more in detail. Yeah, that is a, is a, a really difficult question. And it's one that we and our students uh, sometimes, you know, have a little bit of trouble getting our heads around. One way to think about it is, you know, sustainability is about trying to create the world that we want to live in. Do we want to live in a world in which there's racial discrimination and injustice? No. So we're not talking about let's sustain and maintain the world we have. That's not good enough. 
It's about trying to create the world that we want, thinking about you know, a, a wide range of issues, not just the environment, but issues about uh, human rights and social justice and how we want to come closer to that kind of an ideal world that we would like to live in. One way that I've found recently that uh, can help make this concrete is, uh, I think it's about two years ago now, uh, the United Nations, the 190 national sovereign governments uh, that are part of the UN, developed an agenda for the year 2030 that lays out 17 different uh, sustainable development goals. And when you look at those goals, and all of these are under that, that umbrella, that rubric of sustainable development, included in there are goals for ending poverty, ending hunger, improving gender equity, improving equity in a variety of other ways. So with the UN having come out with these new sustainable development goals, that provides a very concrete way that we can communicate to our students that, look, it's not just Dickinson or a professor saying that these issues of social justice are part of sustainability. This is something that 190 plus governments around the world have said. So what are some of the ways you, you talked about uh, going into the working with the community as one of the things that is something that is, is good about what Dickinson can do because of the kind of community that it's in. So what are some of the ways that students are actually engaging with the community and not just within the college itself? We had a course last last spring, a year ago, that was on issues of, of food and poverty. And the students in that class worked with some community organizations to do an assessment of food security in Cumberland County. Cumberland County is, is the county in which Carlisle is located. Um, so the students were doing uh, research on you know, what percentage of, of the population is food secure or food insecure, challenges, issues in um, you know, obtaining sufficient uh, nutritious food, what are the issues that people face, uh, what kinds of resources are, are here to help people with those challenges, and kind of laying out a, you know, some possible responses and options for it. So that they produced a report at the end of the semester that has gone to our local government as well as some, some community organizations. And so that's something where they're, you know, the community is now looking at what possible actions they might take. Uh, one follow-up to that was uh, in the fall, we had another course on social innovation and entrepreneurship for seniors, um, in which uh, a couple of students in that course were then looking at, there's a, a, one of the neighborhoods of Carlisle um, on the north side of town, which is an area of you know, a large percentage of the population, uh, the households there are low income, living at or near the poverty level. There's also no grocery store in that part of town, and it's been called a food desert, which is a, you know, a complex idea that there's some, some disagreement about just, you know, what that means. But it's an area of, of the community where there isn't a supermarket uh, readily accessible without a car. Um, and so the students were doing research uh, that would help that we've got a, a former uh, factory site that's a brownfield. And they were doing sort of marketing studies and research on is that a viable location for a supermarket to locate. And that information is now being um, made available to our economic development uh, uh, corporation uh, for the county uh, for them to work with. I taught a course in the fall. It's called Building Sustainable Communities. I had students doing research projects in teams. One team also followed up on, on these issues of, of food security and food access, and we're looking at challenges of being able to walk or bike to supermarkets, to food stores from that north side neighborhood. And they uh, did a survey of about 150 uh, of the residents uh, in, in the community to learn about uh, what kinds of issues they face in trying to get to uh, to the grocery stores that are in Carlisle. I had another group of students working with uh, the the Cumberland Area Economic Development Corporation on workforce development, that there's a lot of interest. Multiple organizations here are working on looking at how can we do a more holistic, integrated approach to helping those who are struggling to find a job or to find a good paying job or to advance in their current job. Where can they find services and resources to help them acquire better skills, to be more effective in job searches, uh, to improve how they're doing in, in, in their jobs? So I had students working on uh, developing a, what's called an asset map of what organizations in our county provide services in that area, and that's been provided to the uh, 
uh, to local stakeholders for them to work with. Another group of students worked with the uh, Cumberland County Planning uh, Department to look at the planning department has to update our natural hazard mitigation plan in the coming year. Um, and the students did research to help them think about how might the risks from climate change affect the way they plan for and try to mitigate the hazards that people living in the county face. So th those are some examples of the way that we're getting students out in, into the community and really working on real, authentic, important, challenging problems that our community is, is trying to uh, navigate and figure out how to manage better. What's been the reaction of the students? I, I assume that students who choose to go to Dickinson are already sort of somewhat interested in this, but how are they sort of adopting that into their own lives? Is this seen as a sort of a net positive by the students? And, and what do you expect then for them taking that into their careers beyond Dickinson? Yeah, so there's, you know, as you can imagine, there's a wide range of uh, responses from students on this. So when I first came to Dickinson 10 years ago, there, you know, very definitely the first year, couple years that I was here, there were some vocal students who uh, really questioned this. And, you know, in some ways, you know, you know, some of the seniors that first year were saying, hey, you know, this is not the Dickinson that I came to. This is not this is not the, the kind of uh, institution that I thought I was coming to. They were in the minority, but they were vocal. Now, 10 years later, the students who come to Dickinson are finding the sort of information that you describe uh, in the introduction, that they're aware that sustainability is a core value of what we do at Dickinson, and it's going to be part of their education here. And so it's not a surprise to anyone who, who comes uh, to our institution. So that being said, there are some students who embrace this and make it very much part of, of who they are, what they're about. Other students whose attitudes are more sort of a live and let live kind of thing, of it, it's not what excites them, but they're happy that some he's doing this. There, there are probably a few students, but I don't interact with them very much. They, they don't come and talk to me and seek me out, those who uh, uh, might take a, a, a very different view on sustainability. What would you say are some of the lessons learned for other institutions, specifically other universities? I know there's no like real easy, like, here are the five steps to become more sustainable, but I know that there are lots of other universities that would like to move sort of in this direction, but maybe don't necessarily have a center for sustainability education. What would you say would be some of the lessons learned for them? Yeah, I, you know, I think one lesson is, you know, you want, if, you, if you're going to have a, a significant initiative on educating for sustainability, it really needs to have support from multiple parts of the institution. You know, it's not something that, that will work well if, you know, a senior administrator just, you know, decides, hey, this is a good idea, let's run with it, that it requires building uh, the support for it amongst your faculty, amongst student groups, your campus operations facilities management people are very key on this. So it's something that, that's, you know, best done as, as you know, kind of a, a gradual um, program to build support for it. On the academic side, the curriculum side, you know, you'll find there are a lot of schools that do really good, interesting work, important work on campus operations. Fewer schools um, have really embraced the idea of making education for sustainability a significant, meaningful part of their curriculum, of their academic programs. That takes time. So, it, you know, it took Dickinson a good five plus years before we really had made some good progress of revising existing courses, creating new courses. Um, and we got to the point where I think it's about three years ago now where the faculty felt comfortable that they made sustainability um, a graduation requirement at Dickinson. So every student has to have at least one sustainability related course um, in order to earn a Dickinson degree. That's not something you can just mandate quickly. That's something you have to build the, the courses, the curriculum to support that over time. One of the things which has really been important is there are um, – associations in which colleges and universities get together and share ideas. So your question is one that lots of schools ask, and we're, Dickinson is a member of a group 
called the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. There's about, I think it's close to 900 colleges and universities are members. They have annual meetings, other activities where we get together and share what we do, learn from what others are doing. It's very much an active uh, area of conversation amongst people in higher education of, um, you know, what is the sustainability education thing about? How do we do it well? How do we extend it farther? It's a curious and interesting kind of area in which, you know, colleges, you know, like any kind of institution are competitive. You know, we're trying to attract excellent students and we're trying to attract students that other schools are trying to attract and faculty and staff. And so colleges aren't always, you know, willing to be, you know, fully cooperative, collaborative with others about, hey, we're doing this and we're doing it well and we want to share these ideas with you so that you can uh, uh, excel as well. In the area of sustainability, that kind of, of ethos is part of sustainability. And so it creates a little bit of a tension, uh, um, you know, as, you know, I and my colleagues at Dickinson, we go to national meetings or regional meetings or interact with our colleagues at other schools, and we're trying to help them figure out how can they do similar things at their institutions. And in some respects, there may be some at Dickinson who are, you know, would say, hey, whoa, do, do do we really want to do that? Do we, you know, because Dickinson does have a comparative advantage. We have um, a reputation for uh, education for sustainability. We're leaders in that. We want to continue to be perceived as leaders in that. I share that feeling, but I also share the feeling that this is a movement that really needs to spread across as many schools as possible. And so we very actively try to share, you know, our ideas about how you do this well. You mentioned that the facilities team at a university or college is going to be important in this in, as well. And I, I note on the website that you say that you're trying to be carbon neutral by 2020, which is an extremely ambitious plan. Uh, as we know, recent reports have said that the uh, carbon emissions for <laughs> the U.S. have actually gone up recently instead of down, as we're supposed to be doing. Is, what are some of the things uh, that Dickinson is doing to, to reach carbon neutrality? Yeah, so we um, we made that commitment, I think it was the year I came to Dickinson, uh, that we would become climate or carbon neutral by the year 2020. Um, and in doing that, we would reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases 25% from what they were in 2008. And then the emissions that we uh, have not eliminated by that time, we would offset through you know a variety of means. And, and it's uh, we can get into that in a moment if you want to pursue that. But what are we doing to reduce emissions? You know, trying to be very efficient about how we use energy on campus. The majority of our greenhouse gas emissions, it's mostly carbon dioxide. Most of that is a result of, of fossil energy use. Um, so we've been working to make our use of energy very efficient, um, conserving energy. We just completed last year. It took us about a year and a half to do it, but we replaced 90 plus percent of the lighting that's uh, on our campus, both indoor and outdoor lighting uh, using LED uh, lighting, um, which consumes, I think it's something about 70% of the amount of electricity that incandescent uh, uh, lighting does. So that's um, uh, having a big effect for us. Um, we've done things where improving the way in which airflow is handled in our science building. Um, our, our science complex is one of the biggest energy uh, hogs on campus. Um, and part of that is because of uh, requirements of you know, having to uh, bring in fresh air from outside and expel, you know, the air that's been in the building for a while where you've got, you know, labs and whatnot. And so there's issues about, you know, are, are there some hazardous things in the air that build up in these labs if you don't uh, exchange the air with the outside frequently enough? Um, and there are regulations, standards about how often you have to do that. But those standards were uh, about three years ago were changed to recognize that when those labs aren't occupied, you don't need to have as much of an of an air exchange uh, going on. And so we were, you know, working with uh, some energy consultants, uh, reprogrammed the computer uh, technology that controls the air exchanges, so that they were being done. Uh, we're measuring levels of carbon dioxide in the rooms, which tell us if those rooms are occupied and how, how many people are occupying them, and we can better match the air circulation to the actual use of those rooms. And that saved us an enormous amount of energy. Um, so that's been really good. We signed last year 
uh, a power purchasing agreement with what was Solar City at the time, and now Tesla bought them up, so it's with Tesla, where they uh, built a three megawatt uh, solar uh, uh, electric field for us on uh, land the college owns. And so they put up the capital uh, investment to build it, and we've signed a 20 or 25 year contract to buy electricity, solar electricity from them um, at, a, at a very uh, good rate for us. Um, so this is not going to, it's not costing us additional money, it's a, a savings for us, and that's going to provide um, at least 25% of our annual electricity consumption um, and probably a bit more than that. And so that's, that's a major uh, 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 change that's helping us. So it it sounds like from what you're saying, and this is uh, something we heard in our previous episode as well, that really a lot of the solutions uh, to reducing the carbon emissions, both at a place like Dickinson, but you know, could could certainly be scaled up. The solutions are already there, and it's a matter of making that a priority and and putting those things into place. Do you think that that is largely true? It's sort of bigger conversation, but uh, you know, what what are the things that we can sort of learn from a place like Dickinson being able to move to to carbon neutrality and sort of expanding that uh, to a larger to a, a city or a state being able to do something like that? Yeah, and that's something which, you know, over the last several years that we've seen a shift um, in conversations both in the United States and internationally, where, you know, it had been, you know, the emphasis had been put for a long time on what national governments could do and what they could do individually and what they could do operating through, you know, the UN system in order to address climate change. We've been finding, though, that much of the action, you know, is really happening not through national governments, but it's happening through city governments and state governments and individual private organizations such as colleges and universities, but also uh, corporations, private for-profit corporations. You know, so that what Dickinson is doing is very much part of um, a larger trend internationally and nationally. Um, so it is, you know, it is very much the case that these solutions, what's happening on climate change, certainly in the United States, given that there's, you know, the federal leadership on this is going in the wrong direction. Uh, Yet the U.S. is, you know, going to continue to make some good progress through the actions that are happening um, at, um, in contexts other than, than the federal government. Um, I was just at a conference um, uh, last week of the National Council for Science and the Environment, um, and one of the speakers was talking about what will it take to get to very low emissions of, of greenhouse gases, get to a, a zero or near zero carbon energy economy. And the point that was made, and this is consistent with you know um, other work that I've, I've I've read and follow, um, we have the the technologies, we have the solutions, they exist. That when you also look at you know the economics of of renewable energy, of zero carbon energy, that the cost of these technologies have come down dramatically over the last 10 years. And so, you know, these, these, you know, the solutions are here. We can do this with the existing technology. Um, you know, we can find ways to, to get to, you know, uh, a very low carbon, uh, carbon economy. Um, it takes, though, decisions by people who, you know, value and put a priority on doing this. Um, there's some who think that the market will move us in that direction, you know, on its own. I think that's overly optimistic. I think we need policies at city, state, and eventually federal levels to make this happen. Neil, is there anything else that you wanted to make sure that we talk about today? You know, the one other thing which I'd like to talk a little bit about is, you know, in you know, the, the way that we've approached at Dickinson integrating um, education for sustainability in our um, academic and co-curricular programs is one that really is, you know, it incorporates, um, involves our programs in arts and humanities, um, social sciences and physical sciences. And, you know, I think that's that's useful for, for your listeners to kind of to have that awareness that this isn't just, um, you know, the way we do it at Dickinson or at other schools, it's not just a science program. Um, it's not just environmental science, but these are things that, that really are part of, you know, every student's education um, and across, you know, a wide range of disciplines that to make progress on, to understand um, the kinds of challenges that we face, um, you know, climate change and 
poverty and nutrition and, you know, uh, human health issues, a wide range of issues. It takes a lot of different people with very different um, expertise. Um, and whatever students come here to study and whatever they see themselves doing in the future, um, they're going to need the skills, uh, capabilities to, you know, understand how do I work with people who come at issues, problems, who have a different kind of academic training, a different set of skills, a different way of looking at problems. How do I work with them effectively? And so we've got courses, you know, in all different kinds of departments um, uh, that, you know, address these sorts of issues. So, you know, one example would be, um, you know, in uh, our Spanish department, um, you know, they've got courses, um, uh, they've got a course that's called Sustainability in Context of uh, Hispanic Cultures, another course on human rights and contemporary uh, Latin American literature, um, another course on Spanish for health professionals. Each of these courses um, has students engaging with taking up um, exploring challenges that relate to sustainability in some way and connecting it to their major in Spanish. Um, you know, and so that's, you know, a very different way of approaching this than what, you know, some schools approach this by saying, oh, let's, let's add a new major. Let's add a sustainability studies major. That can be a very valuable thing to do, and it's useful to have students who have uh, a major where they're really focused on, on these things. But the vast majority of uh, the people who come to Dickens and to other colleges and universities, you know, they're not going to be experts in sustainability, but they're going to be leading lives in which they're going to be making decisions, they're going to be voting, they're going to be doing other things. We're having an awareness of, of these problems and challenges and potential solutions that are going to be necessary. So, you know, that, that's the motivation for why we're coming at this uh, from the point of view of it. It shouldn't be a specialized program that is just for a, a small cohort of students, but it really should be something that, that becomes part of the education of all of our students. Excellent. Well, Neil, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. I think that, that this gives me great hope that no matter what the federal government may be mandating or not mandating, as the case may be, that, that institutions can really take the lead on this and can really develop sustainable practices. Yeah. And I think that's really important because a lot of the news, you know, coming out, you know, on a wide range of issues uh, to do with the environment uh, in particular, you know, is really negative. It's, you know, and we struggle with, you know, uh, students who, who, you know, find this really challenging. They seem to be insurmountable problems that um, we're not dealing with them appropriately. Um, but there's lots of reasons to have optimism as well. Um, you know, you don't want to be naively optimistic, but, you know, you know, we do have the, the technologies, the tools, the understanding to, you know, really make solid progress on, on a lot of these issues. And I think that, you know, we're, we're going to be navigating a, a direction that, that, you know, will lead us to, to, to good outcomes and not to catastrophe. All right. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk to us, and, and thank you for uh, helping raise this next generation of uh, sustainable humans. Thanks for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Immunuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wethlin and was created for use by this podcast.